2019 will be remembered as the year when the Bangsamoro Organic Law, or the BOL, was ratified, institutionalizing the Comprehensive Agreement on the Bangsamoro and finally ending the war between the government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, or the MILF. 2019 also heralded the birth of a new regional government called the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao or BARM and a transitional administrator called the Bangsamoro Transition Authority or BTA. The BTA is composed of appointed officials representing the various peace tables, raising expectations of a more durable peace. And indeed, the parties seem to have hit the ground running as violent incidents continue to decline. Twenty nineteen marks three consecutive years with drops in violent incidents that were further sustained in the first half of twenty twenty, amid lockdowns to control the spread of COVID nineteen. Though violence had not rebounded to the same levels before the war in Marawi, the data nevertheless show that violent conflict had been falling since then. Maguindanao, including the city of Cotabato, Basilan, including the city of Isabela, and Sulu posted lower numbers. The number of deaths also dropped in 2019, in step with the decline in the number of incidents. The death count fell in Maguindanao, Basilan, Sulu, and Tawi-Tawi. Basilan province became the Cinderella story in this year's report, reflecting a return from the abyss of war and uncertainty towards some level of tranquility and security. Declining violence was also matched by a shift in the kind of violence. Basilan used to be the prime example of terrorist contagion and conflict. By 2019, the number of incidents and deaths from extremist violence and terrorism had plummeted. These are all cause for celebration. Many have argued that the enactment of the BOL had something to do with it. Others say that these are positive outcomes of development and peace-building efforts by various groups within the state, the private sector, and civil society. The explanation may hold true in the case of Basilan, as security measures were combined with development projects. These projects enticed many Abu Sayyaf members to surrender and avail of livelihood and reskilling initiatives, pushing back extremist violence by 62% and the number of deaths by 76%. However, the bigger canvas displays a different picture. A closer look at the evidence shows that the same dynamic we witnessed in 2018 was recurring. The extension of martial law that lasted up to December 2019 snuffed out other potential flashpoints before they could erupt. The lockdown following the COVID-19 pandemic would produce the same effects. As well, the 2019 midterm elections would face the same spike in violence that has been a feature of previous election years. So, as it was in the past, peace, it seems, was less contrived and more happenstance. Peace remained fragile and the risks abundant. Why was this the case? An easy explanation is that peace takes a while to grow, and peace agreements hardly lead to a post-conflict future at once, or at all. But there's another plausible reason. Other studies have shown that democratic transitions can spin off identity-based ethnic conflicts when conditions for open, inclusive, and accountable rule are not in place. Violent conflict will reignite with more horrific effects against disadvantaged communities, ethnic and indigenous groups. These perspectives bear watching. They describe the kind of situation that the Bangsamoro faces today, a period of transition-induced or transitional conflict spurred by pockets of violence in the least likely places and for the most obscure reasons. We begin with the most likely cause of conflict in any democratic transition conflict over resources such as land. In 2019, disputes over land in the Bangsamoro remained high. One would expect this type of violence to be less likely to happen under the watch of the legislative and executive leaders of the BTA and BARM. Various groups had in fact warned about this possibility long before the BOL was ratified, but to no avail. Worse, being the most likely cause of violence did not translate into it being the most anticipated source of flashpoints too. The MILF-led BTA was so unprepared to deal squarely with the issue, probably because various armed groups were involved, including their own. Ironically, the biggest threat to the fragile peace was located at the center of the war against violent extremism in 2017, Marawi and the province of Lanao del Sur. 
data show that levels of extremist violence involving remnants of the Maote group remained, though with deadlier results as fatalities recorded in 2019 were higher than in 2018. Local communities in Lanao del Sur also experienced more incidents of clan feuding, illegal drug and illicit firearm-related incidents and robberies. There were also more deaths due to illegal drugs and illicit firearms. Meanwhile, having been driven underground, violent extremism has become resilient, with rowing further south and harnessing new recruits in Sulu. Sulu, in contrast to Basilan and Magidanao, posted the lowest decline in the incidence of violent extremism at 13% and deaths at 10%. Sulu saw a decline in intensity but an explosion in magnitude. Deaths per incident became higher, especially in case of indiscriminate and suicidal attacks. Racked by the cumulative impact of a cycle of Filipino, female, and foreign suicide bombers and the continued recruitment and radicalization of youth and women, Sulu would return to the trajectory of terrorist violence in 2019 and well into the first half of 2020. Shadow economies in illicit drugs and illegal guns also persisted as the leading causes of conflict, particularly in the last quarter of 2019, or around the time when martial law in Mindanao was to be lifted. The resilience of shadow economy violence reveals the intractable nature of certain deadly economies and the inability of the state to root out these sources of violence. Specifically, the use and trade of illegal weapons such as handguns remained rampant as violent actors squared off in many clashes related to extremist violence and the 2019 elections. Finally, we must note that 2019 and early 2020 saw the onrush of multi-causal violence plus newly emerging violence and conflicts brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. First, multiple overlaps between identity, political, and resource-based conflicts produced many conflict strings in Maguindanao and Lanao del Sur. Multicausal conflict accompanied the resurgence of clan feuding over land issues and long-standing personal and political grudges. Second, in terms of gender-based violence, the data reveal a spike in incidents in the first two months of the community lockdown. The decline in gender-related violence coincided with the loosening of lockdown rules in May. Third, the Alert Critical Events Monitoring System recorded many instances of violence resulting from opposition to lockdowns and checkpoints. Cultural insensitivities created tensions especially in the handling of the sick and the dead. Fourth, newly emerging violence from endowment collapse as youth unemployment increased fueled shadow economy-related violence in many urban areas. Fifth, tensions arose, threats were made, and violent actions taken to monopolize access to vital resources such as water and food. To address the remaining deficits that drag the onset of a durable peace, three steps are most critical. One, acting on land-related conflicts must be treated as the first priority of the BTA. Land conflict was predicted long ago as the single most important trigger of violence in the transition period. Addressing land issues is also critical in rebuilding Marawi and in establishing the foundations of long-term, peaceful, and equitable development. 2. A better orchestrated and multi-pronged approach to prevent and counter violent extremism is needed. Violent extremism remains the focus of disjointed actions that emphasize intelligence gathering and security operations. With little capacity building in the de-radicalization of the youth, the implementation of restorative justice programs, or the conduct of social media campaigns to prevent propaganda and recruitment. 3. Policies in curbing the use and proliferation of illegal drugs and illicit firearms need to be scaled up to prevent these from fueling war and extremist violence. Harnessing the MILF in the anti-illegal drug war remains critical as well as strengthening legal institutions and capacity of law enforcers to seize and forfeit assets and profits of drug lords. In conclusion, we can say that the twin events of 2019, the passage of the BOL and the nomination and appointment of new set of leaders were vital steps that strengthened the legitimacy of the newly devolved regional authority and helped hasten the conflict to peace transition. That transition must remain democratic to avoid new cycles of violence, and the 2022 elections is central to its completion. The government and the local, national, and international community, especially those that helped enable the political settlement that gave birth to the BOL, can help by ensuring that the parties remain committed to the original agreements, 
support their implementation, and hold the parties accountable to the new rules established. In the end, perceptions of legitimacy are critical to state-society relations and to the development of an authentic social contract for peace.